very much. Great. So uh, we're going to move on to our, our final speaker of the day, but first we have a poll question. Kaylin, can you cue that up? Have you participated in vasculitis research? I'll give you guys a minute to answer that. Okay, Kaylin, let's see what we got here. Wow, so that's a pretty active group, but room, room for more. Uh, so it looks like most of us have, and there are those of us out there who want to. Uh, so that's gonna uh, cue us up for our next speaker who really needs no introduction. If you're an advanced patient, you probably uh, know Dr. Merkel by name or have heard him speak at one of the conferences. Uh, Dr. Merkel is Chief of Rheumatology and a Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania. He is an internationally recognized research and clinical expert in vasculitis and scleroderma, two diseases he has studied for over 25 years and is an author of over 300 scientific publications. He is the principal investigator of the NIH-sponsored Vasculitis Clinical Research Consortium, otherwise known as the VCRC, a leading international research infrastructure for vasculitis clinical investigation. Dr. Merkel's research focuses on clinical trial design and conduct, outcome measure development, clinical epidemiology, genetic epidemiology, and biomarker discovery. Welcome, Dr. Merkel. Thank you for being here today. Hi, it's great to see you and uh, know that there are a lot of other people online. Also, it's nice to follow Dr. Springer because now I can do less because he explained quite a few things. I knew actually he was doing that. We, uh, we were in cahoots a bit. So I do know that he was going to talk about a few things that I was going to talk. So let me um, share my screen. I think that's what you want me to do. So I can bring up my talk. And let me know, uh, Dr. Gordon, if I am coming through fairly clearly. Yes, we see you and we can hear you clearly. Because I was going to use the mic, but it uh, made I, meant I couldn't hear anybody. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and go through this and hopefully leave time for questions because uh, I know that uh, people generally do have questions and I'll let you go with us. So my charge today, um, because Jane Gordon told me to and I do everything she says, was to talk about clinical trials and vasculitis and I'm calling this what's new and what's for you. And this is really an exciting time as Dr. Springer said to be in vasculitis. These are again the list, you see this all the time, of most but not all of the different forms of vasculitis. And what I wanna show you is that we're now studying as a community of investigators, most of the names of most of these diseases that are on the screen. There is more research being done in vasculitis now than any point in history. Given the progress we've made in the past 25 years, that's a remarkable statement, but it's true. We keep seeing more and more vasculitis research. I wanna remind you that there are many types of clinical research studies. We tend to really concentrate on the clinical trials, but you should know that there are registries that can provide important information, often information we can't get from clinical trials. There are surveys and epidemiologic studies that are very important to understand disease and to bring us new ideas. There are observational longitudinal studies that we've done that have added a great deal to our understanding about disease and stimulate new treatments. There's biological specimen collection, again, incredibly important to study the science of these diseases, the basic science. There's new diagnostic tools that are developed. And then there are trials, and these trials can be open label, where you know what you're getting, randomized, blinded, which are randomized control trials, the RCTs. Those are the big ones that get the headlines. But they're also single arm. You know you're getting this drug, multi-arm drugs and other treatments, and sometimes they're at one center and sometimes they're multi-center. And so it's good to keep in mind that there's a lot of different types of research. There's some of this just done at one center at the University of Pennsylvania. We conduct a number of different research studies in vasculitis just at our center. And if we develop new ideas that we want to go further, we bring them to other centers and have them join us. There are multi-center networks such as the Vasculitis Clinical Research Consortium, which I have the privilege to direct European Vasculitis Society and the French Vasculitis Study Group to name the three largest ones. There's funding 
makes a big difference. There's investigator initiated where we get grants from NIH or from other areas. There's industry sponsored, which you've heard about, and we will, and then there's the combination where we might get drug and some money, but we run the studies. And all of these things have been done in vasculitis very successfully. Um, just to show you how much work there's being done in vasculitis, I want to show you very briefly the agenda from a meeting I hosted uh, 10 days ago. Every year, the VCRC hosts an investigators meeting before the American College of Rheumatology meeting. This year, it was all virtual because that's what we're doing. And this is remarkable. 160-something people joined this over uh, in a Sunday. And we had Four different segments. We had a lot of work done on diagnosis and classification, trials in giant arteritis and tachyostasis, and I'll go over some of these. Work on uh, clinical trial infrastructures, outcome measures, how to measure disease better, how to study other forms of vasculitis, low-dose naltrexone, cutaneous vasculitis, all sorts of different studies. Studies in EGPA church Strauss, update on our longitudinal cohorts and our networks, which are doing survey studies and collecting specimens. And we're starting new ones of this in new forms of vasculitis, such as CNS vasculitis, and many studies in granular ptosis polyangitis and microscopic polyangitis. So there's just an amazing amount being done in vasculitis in the world. I've been doing this a long time and I haven't ever seen this much. Let's start with MPA and GPA, but I want to make it very clear to everybody, although that is, those are the diseases that get the most attention in a way because there's been a lot of success and there's been, there's a, a good number of people who have it relative to other forms of vasculitis. There are really a lot of research being done even in quite rare forms of vasculitis. So what's really new in AAV? And I'm not going to go over the actual data because I know that Dr. Springer just did that. But there are several major trials completed and reported out in the past year. And I want to put it into the perspective of what's happening across the world. So you heard about Pexavas. So this is a trial that I was one of the principal investigators on. It took us 10 years to complete. It was the largest trial ever done. And we published it in the New England Journal. And the big points that I'm sure Dr. Springer made, I joined after he did that, were the key points were that plasma exchange called plasmapheresis, this, this process of taking off antibodies, did not prevent kidney failure or death relative to not using it. That doesn't mean there's not a role for it, but this experiment didn't show that, and now it's being used much less frequently. And the second part of this study, which is, I think, as important, if not more, was that using uh, almost half as much prednisone was just as good and safer than using the usual doses. And we think this has changed the standard of care and people are now using this regimen of lower dose prednisone and we're hoping to go even lower as I'll show you. But this was an important advance. The Ritazram study, which I'm also running with my friend and colleague, Dr. Jane in Europe. This is a study that we've completed. Uh, we have reported out the final results last week, but we don't yet have to have it published. And this is key points were that rituximab was better than azathioprine for keeping patients in long-term remission. But relapse still happens regularly, even with the use of either drug. So we have more ways to go. But, and we have a lot to learn from this trial about prediction of relapse, drug safety, and biomarkers. We have an enormous amount of data and specimens, and this will be very helpful as we do additional analyses. That's another theme is that those of us who study vasculitis, we like to get the most out of the data and the most out of the volunteers who take part. You put your lives on the line, you put your time and effort, and we want to make sure we use the data and the blood that we collect as much and as often as we can to answer good scientific questions. The Avacapan study, the advocate study you just heard about from Dr. Springer. Uh, again, I was uh, one of the key people to help run this study. This is a major advance. I think I agree fully. Uh, we are, will soon publish these results, but for patients with AAV treated with cyclophosphamide or rituximab, avacopan, and no additional glucocorticoids were just as good or better than glucocorticoids alone. Plus, the, So that is really helpful. We think this is a way to treat patients up front without having to use much more steroids than after, the, let's say, the first week, for example. This drug may change how we treat, and it's going to think about, it's going to change us how we think about glucocorticoids in general for vasculitis, not just this form, but other forms of vasculitis and other inflammatory and immune mediated diseases are looking at this kind of work and saying, well, maybe we can also get away with less prednisone if we have another type of drug. 
So just to remind you that there were all these different trials that were discussed. There are, uh, these studies were complete. These are ongoing studies, our abrogate study in the VCRC, looking at yet another different drug called abatacept. There's uh, the French are looking at another way of look, using rituximab. And then there's treatment for people who have a lot of trouble staying in remission. There's a, some studies of new drugs um, uh, in other parts of the world. The Chinese are looking at a drug called leflunamide, which is an old drug, but inexpensive and may be helpful. And then there are, drug, there are studies that we're doing to look about very low dose prednisone. Do you really need to stay on a little bit or can you come off fit? And then, as Dr. Springer mentioned, these complement inhibitors, this whole new approach, the Avacapan study, and this other group of uh, trials that I'm also helping to run using another agent. So this is very exciting to see all these different drugs, all these different approaches and strategies to try to treat patients better, safer. What about eGPA, Church Strauss? Well, we know that mepolizumab, this is a study we did and published in the journal a few years ago. This is a new drug for eGPA, and it's the first drug ever approved. And this study and another study we published with the same data just a year or two later really demonstrated a few key points. This drug is effective in treating upper airway disease and asthma and allows some patients to reduce their prednisone. More data is needed to know if this drug will work in more severe forms of the disease. Good thing that those trials are being done. So again, a bunch of studies being done. The idea that there are four different trials now going on in eGPA is remarkable since only a few years ago we had zero. So the French are doing a number of different, somewhat related studies, uh, some in rituximab, some in epilizumab for more severe disease. And AstraZeneca and a study that I'm in involved with is comparing two different forms of this type of drug that blocks this one chemical called IL-5. So there's a lot of work being done in eGPA, so that's also encouraging. Uh, we have an ongoing longitudinal study of eGPA. We've actually enhanced this and made this even stronger. Uh, we're a big push, and many of you have joined this study recently. So if you have eGPA, we would love you to join the study if you're near one of our centers. There's also an opportunity to just join online. What about polyarteritis nodosa, a relatively rare form of vasculitis, but it's been, we've known about it for many, many years. This study from the New England Journal was very important. These two studies actually identified a gene that really identifies a new kind of disease called DADA2. The reason this is interesting is it looks like PAN, but it's really a different disease. And then we did a big study that is going to be published pretty soon. It's been accepted. We used the Vasculitis Clinical Research Consortium. We had over 100 patients, which is actually a lot with PAN. And we found a number of these patients actually have DADA2. So what do these studies tell us? They tell us that DADA2 is a distinct disease that's like PAN, but not really the same. And treatment for DADA2 is different, so it's important to know what we're getting into. And it's probably hiding among patients with PAN. And what this tells us is we should screen genetically for patients with PAN to see if they have DADA2, but also, at least some of the patients, the right ones, there are probably other genetic diseases hiding among our diseases with vasculitis, and we're doing a lot of work to try to find them because that would be helpful. <clears throat> so, for example, if we found a different subset of disease in, a, let's say, in CNS vasculitis, and we could understand how to treat it better because of that genetic marker, that would be terrific. So what about large vessel vasculitis, Takayasu's arteritis, and giant cell arteritis? These are very different types of vasculitis from the types I've just been talking about, but they're important types. So this was an important study that Dr. Springer also brought up, which is tocilizumab for giant cell arteritis. And the key points of this were that it works. It was helpful in treating patients with GCA, and many of them were able to get off prednisone. But many also had relapse. And so what we're finding in many of our autoimmune diseases and inflammatory diseases is that these wonderful new drugs can work, but they often work for only a subset of patients or only some of the time. And so there's still need for new treatments or combinations. And so it also showed that drug companies are interested in GCA. How interested? 
quite interesting because you can see here there are multiple studies. The first two are run by investigators. I'm helping to run the first one through the VCRC, but we got substantial support from a drug company to use this drug and to support the trial. Similarly, for these other studies of methotrexate versus tocilizumab and these other drug names, all of we like to have very complicated drug names. All of these are different types of drugs for the same disease. So there's an exciting time in studying giant cell arteritis. Not to be left out, Takayasu arteritis, there are two studies being done as well around the world, uh, one in Turkey and one in China. These are very difficult studies to do. We just completed one a few years ago, and we're hoping to do another one uh, with new agents. So progress is being made. So what about Bay Jets? Lots of studies in Bay Jets, actually. None. There's a couple active now, uh, and there's been a drug that was approved for Bay Jets. So there's success in that uh, form of vasculitis as well. Cryoglobulinemic vasculitis, there's an early studies being done now in that. Again, an interesting form of vasculitis. Kawasaki disease that strikes children. A number of trials have led to treatment guidelines, which help us understand how to treat it. And there are still ongoing interest in studying this disease in a trial. And anti-GBM disease, also known as good pastures disease, a, 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 quite a rare form of vasculitis, affects the kidneys and lungs. And there's a trial being done in that as well. So what else do we need? What do we really need? Well, you will see that we're really into trying to get rid of steroids because like you, we hate them. They're the best drugs we have. They're the worst drugs we have. We have to find a way to get people on lower dose and try to avoid it. We need to get away from using cyclophosphamide. We need to keep mindfully, be, be mindful that women during childbearing years need drugs that will not cause sterility and will allow them to have families. We need a reduction in infections, which is now perhaps the even biggest problem in treating patients with vasculitis. We need drugs that are less expensive, that, are, that people can get their hands on. We need more rapid induction of remission, get to no active disease quicker so less damage happens. But we also need to prevent the relapse, which happens. Relapse rates are high, even on treatment, and we need to be able to treat people who have really difficult disease. We want to treat mild to moderate disease. Sometimes we only look at the pretty bad disease, and we, there are a lot of people who have mild to moderate disease that really impacts their lives, and we want to be able to treat them better too. And we need to be able to treat the flares. Some forms of vasculitis need some treatment, meaning there's no treatment for some forms, and that's just not acceptable. We have to figure out a way to treat them with better evidence, and we need some non-drug therapies, surgical or other things, to help correct problems. And I like to always end by thinking that we need a cure, because we do. Why not? We should be aiming to cure each form of vasculitis, and I think that is a reality that can happen. Um, so I wanted to mention a few other things that are happening in research to update everybody. I've done this before, but this is the update of the update. Classification. So this is basically saying, how do we group different diseases so we can do research? It's a very important topic, and we will be publishing almost certainly in the next six to 12 months the final results of a 10-year study that we've done on about five different forms of vasculitis to really understand how do, we use, how do we label patients with different forms of vasculitis for treatment uh, trials. That will be very important. There's additional work being done in PAN, really representing polychondritis. So that's an important research tool that we're developing. There's a lot of work in genetics in lots of different diseases. And what you'll see is that we are going to learn more about how genetics affects our patients. Many patients, there's probably a signal that makes it more likely you'll get the disease, but it's not like hair color or high color or some other diseases like sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis, which is one gene. These are probably multiple genes combined with maybe an infection or the environment or just really bad luck. And so we're learning from this and this will help us understand subsets of disease and probably how to treat people better. Biomarkers, these are how do we follow patients better? How do we learn to treat better? When can we start and when should we stop treatment? And there's a lot of work being done in biomarkers. It's a very difficult area. Meta meta metabolomics and microbiome, this is very hot area. We know that we have a lot of bugs in our system. We, we, a lot of um, bacteria live in us. They live on our skin. They live in our airway, our nose. They live in our gut. And they are interacting with us and our immune system. Uh, people take probiotics. I'm not sure that's always a, the right thing because it, you know, 
the changes could be good, could be bad, but we're trying to figure out what, what's good and what's bad. Actually, with this is some work being done in our center as well. And so that's a very new, interesting area. And then we're trying to figure out how to study the disease better. And there's a lot of work being done on that. Um, we keep refining how we study disease. Should we use PET scans to study Takayasu? How do we better measure disease in GPA? How do we measure, how do we even approach a trial in relapsing public and dry? So learning how to study it has really helped us do all the trials I've told you about. And then, of course, the clinical trials. I've come back to that. There are trials in so many different diseases. It's amazing. And I've showed you many of those. And their trials are different types. There are trials that are single arm pilots. Let's take 10 patients and start treating. We don't do this as much as we used to because we want to do bigger trials, but sometimes we learn things from small cases, small number of cases about safety, and maybe we can learn about efficacy and treatment effect. There are small studies for very rare diseases. We're doing small number studies that we're trying to gain some knowledge about. There's some sort of statistical methods we can use to do small trials. Then the big randomized trials I've told you about, those are the ones that really help us get drugs approved, but they're not always possible, but we're doing more and more of those. And then what we call pragmatic studies, which are studies, trials that we put right into practice. Can we do it along with practice? It's more uh, it's it's cost effective. It's 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 cheaper to do these, and it might be a way to get bigger numbers. I wanted to let you know that we uh, have been doing active work in COVID, the VPPRN. We launched a COVID project, really in response to patients' concerns. Patients, everybody who wasn't, who isn't concerned about the pandemic. It's an awful thing that's happened this year. It's getting worse again, and. That's what really most of us was thinking about early this year. We launched the VPPRN COVID-19 project. Over 700 of you have joined this project, which is incredible. We've got important data about how patients feel about the pandemic and how it's impacting their lives. This is just a brief uh, summary of a few things. Uh, we can see that patients are either moderately or very concerned about what's going on, which is appropriate. And nearly half of our patients who responded are taking something that may or may not put them at risk for worse disease. We actually have taken the first part of the survey and we're publishing it. This will be published soon uh, in a major rheumatology journal and to really let others know about what's going on. What are the key points that we've gotten out of this trial so far? Well, that for patients with vasculitis, they're quite concerned about how COVID-19 will affect them, especially when they're on immunosuppressive drugs drugs that change your immune system. There are some patients are sometimes making decisions about their health that may be concerning. They're skipping infusions. They're not going to the doctor as much. This is worrisome. And so what I think we think is that really we should seek good communication with physicians. Patients and doctors need to talk about their concerns and about what's going on in the pandemic because unfortunately it's not going away quite yet. We need more information and data to guide actions, and so do doctors. We need to talk to each other and guide better. I want to remind you that we have a pregnancy registry ongoing, so any patient with any form of vasculitis who's pregnant can join this registry online. It's quite simple, and it's very important that we understand what the risks to developing babies are and what the risks to mothers are with vasculitis, and we now have it in multiple languages. And Kaylin Young has been from the VPPRNVF has been instrumental in helping us launch this as she has with our other VPPRN work. So as I said before, I'll say it again, there is more research being done in vasculitis now than any point in history. The progress made is remarkable. So what's in it for you? Well, I think I've talked about this already, so I'm going to skip this and I'm going to go, uh, why should you participate? And then I'll take questions. Why should someone participate in clinical research in vasculitis? Well, the fifth best reason is rare diseases are hard to study without dedicated volunteer subjects. We can't study it if we don't have subjects. And we know that it's a real, I wouldn't say sacrifice, but it's a burden, it's time, it's effort, and we appreciate it. But we all have to work together to get these studies done. It can be empowering to patients. You're part of the solution. You're part of learning more about vasculitis. It's interesting, for those of you who have been in a study, it's interesting to be in research, whether it's a treatment trial or observational, because we ask all these interesting questions, you have a better understanding of why it takes so long for us to do these things, why is it complicated, and why do we try to do work so hard to get it right? Really, the key issues are you may help others in the future. 
you may help us understand better how to treat or how not to treat and how to understand these diseases better. And advancing understanding of the pathophysiology of vasculitis or how to best treat vasculitis. That's why we do the research. Those are the good reasons to join. Only through properly conducted studies can good science be advanced. And we believe in science and that's how we should be treating people. Okay, so what should you not think about? Why should you not participate in research? These are five reasons not to participate. Don't do it to get rich because I guarantee you, you will not. We actually sometimes cover parking if you're lucky and some travel and there's sometimes reimbursement. That really doesn't come close to the time that you provide. Don't do it because your family member or your partner or your friend thinks the study is a good idea. That's good. It's nice to get advice from people you trust, but it has to be you that wants to join the study. Don't do it because your doctor told you to join the study. Even if I'm your doctor, especially if I'm your doctor, do it because you think it's the right thing to do. You may trust, I hope you trust your doctor, and that's a good conversation to have, but don't do it to make him or her happy. Do it because you think it's the right thing for you. Your doctor's gonna treat you regardless of whether you're part of the study. Do, do it to please your doctor for the same reason. We're happy to, We, have, I have do lots of research, but I have a lot, lot, lot more patients who are not part of studies, and that's just fine. Don't do it because you think you're going to get a cure. These are experiments. And just remember that, what you're getting into. Do it because you want to advance the science. So I just want to ask, are you a member of the VPPRN? I know you've gotten some material about it for this meeting. This is a way to empower yourself. It's a patient-driven, you join, you provide your information, and then we contact you about additional studies. If you are not a member, if you are a member, thank you. If you're not a member, why not? And you can join today and take an active role in research in vasculitis. And with that being said, I'll thank the many different funding. This is probably everything that has funded a lot of the research that I've been involved with that I've, I've told you about. And I've partnered with many of you and the Vasculitis Foundation. And I'm happy to take questions right now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Merkel, for that uh, tour de force of the summary of the research that's been going on. We have a couple of questions that I think would be interest to most of the audience. The first one, um, when do you anticipate that Avacapan could get FDA approval? Well, I have to be a little careful. I'm extremely involved in that trial. I helped direct it, run it. Um, one of, just uh, Dr. Jane and I did that as the academic physicians involved. So I need to be a little careful. I do, I, what the public information is that it's gone to the FDA for review. And we're, of course, hopeful this will happen. The FDA takes a while to review. Let me, I, I can't say the following because I saw the question in the box for Dr. Springer, if I may. So the steps to getting a drug approved by the FDA are many. You have to, many, many, many things have happened before we even do the trial. There's been animal studies. There's been toxicology study. There's been chemical studies. There's been early phase, volunteers, early people without the disease, people with the disease. And then you do the big study. And then they take all of the data and they actually reanalyze it. The FDA wants to see that their statisticians can get the same answer that we got. And they want to look this way and that way appropriately. Are there safety problems? How good is the drug really? And then they come to their own conclusions and come back to the sponsor, whether it be investigator or a company or both and say, here's where we think it is a long process because it needs to be a careful process. The FDA does a careful job. Its job is to guard the lives of the citizens and to make sure the drugs are safe. So it can be frustrating that it can take a while, but they've also sometimes find that things maybe aren't right and they don't want to approve a drug that's not going to help or might harm somebody. So I think it takes, you know, a while, but it's a steady path and, and the public information is that the review should happen within the next year. Thank you. Uh, another question, can you comment on the safety of long-term use of rituximab in GPA? I can. Uh, we actually just published some of that work and some others have as well. And our rituximab study has patients on it for two years and then following it for two more years uh, afterwards. Um, the data to date indicates this drug is really quite safe when used properly. The risk we worry about are your immunoglobins or your antibody levels go down in your blood which could put you at risk for infection. That's not it's generally not the case, but there are some patients who get low and we either give more antibody or we will slow down the drug. There's always the concern about infection and some late reactions. But I must say, even though I was very, I'm a big 
Dan of using these drugs was involved in getting it approved. It's been remarkably safe over the long term, um, but it's in, individual is the issue. We now have people on them over five years, even come closing seven or 10 years. And so we have to be careful. I think what's important is that we're learning that many of our drugs are safe when used properly, but you need to be followed and you need to report if there are any new problems. No drug is without side effects. Thank you. And then one more question, which is timely. Um, I know this is a fuzzy question, but can you comment on whether a COVID vaccine would be good for patients with vasculitis? Uh, I wouldn't call that a fuzzy question. I'd call that an extraordinarily complicated and difficult question. Um, so I think that first of all, there will probably be more than one type of vaccine, we hope, and they may be better for certain people than other people. So we'll have to see whether there's an, there might be a, a type of vaccine that's better or 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 not as good for someone who might have be on a drug that lowers their immune system or not, depending on how they make antibodies. People with rituximab may make less. Different, drug, different vaccines work differently and they cause different responses. Uh, we certainly want to see what the safety is and what uh, the FDA and, the, and all the proper authorities go through the proper process to understand whether the full process that they always do for vaccines or whether or not it's safe. But once it's been declared safe, I think we'll have a better guidance from what happened with the trial, and then we'll be able to figure that out. Um, live vaccines, which I don't think any of the COVID-19 vaccines are, live vaccines can be a problem for people with immunosuppression, but that's not what this is. And so yellow fever is, you know, some of the other ones can be, um, I think. But this, so the COVID-19 vaccines, if they're shown to be uh, useful will be prob will be something that we'll probably want to figure out how to best treat our patients with. Now, there's a timing issue. Vaccines are an area that we need to do even better with with our patients. It, it's there are vaccines out there that I think everybody should get. Everybody should get a flu vaccine. It is it saves lives. It's no doubt about it. There are very few contraindications. You can't get the flu from the flu vaccine. And you can usually get a sore arm, maybe a little tired for a day. It is a very generally very safe vaccine and it can do and it really helps. You also might make your flu not as bad if you're gonna get it or you just stops you. The pneumonia vaccine, there are a couple of them that might be appropriate for people, especially if you're older. I'm not gonna tell you where that line is, but I'm getting close. And um, the shingles vaccine can be very helpful. Shingles is really terrible to get. It's, it ranges from annoying to really bad. It's painful. It's the chickenpox virus coming back to get you when you're older. And that's two shots. And that you should also get as people, it's designed for people 65 or 60 and older. I will tell you, I'm not there yet. And I got it because I think it was, it's useful. Um, that's a vaccine that does require you to make a response. It actually gets you, that, that can make you kind of tired for a day, but it's a good vaccine. What you need to do is talk to your doctor about the timing of that versus the drugs you're on, because that can make things different. And then everybody should be up to date, believe it or not, with measles, mumps, and rubella and tetanus. I mean, adults still need to be up to date with things. And depending where you live, there may be other things. And depending what, if you have children in the house, et cetera. The point is um, vaccine, we, I feel, and I think most of my colleagues and most of the science says, says that vaccines, when done properly, are safe and are very effective for populations and for people, and we need to support them. As always, discuss it with your physician. Thank you very much. On that note, we would also like to sincerely thank all of our uh, presenters today. You did a fantastic job. I know that I certainly learned some new things and I hope you did as well. I hope you've enjoyed it and had your questions answered. We'd also like to thank our sponsors uh, sincerely for their support of these types of programmings and so we can make this available and be able to do it in a way that we can respond to the current uh, pandemic. And then, of course, to all of our staff who have been so pivotal in helping put these events on. And I want to give a special thanks to Jen Gordon for doing such a fantastic job in hosting today. It was a really wonderful event, and we so appreciate your help and your ability to smoothly walk us through 